everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, How Humana Achieves Role-Based Access Control. I'm Shay Mann, and I will be your moderator today. We have got a lot of great content for you, and we'll start by introducing our guest speaker, and then we'll dive into Humana's Identity Program Transformation Story. If you have any questions throughout the event, go ahead and submit them in the Q&A panel, and we will answer them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. This session will be recorded, and we will email you a link to the recorded version tomorrow. We have two speakers joining us today. Rick Weinberg, Vice President of Product Management here at SailPoint, and our very special guest, Andy Weeks, Director of EIP Access Management at Humana. Andy joined Humana in 2003 and leads a talented team of managers and professionals in executing Humana's identity and access management efforts. Andy has experience in multiple business areas, including executive management, entrepreneurship, information security, information technology, strategic planning, and business development. Andy is a graduate of Purdue University and holds a BS in computer and electrical engineering. We have got a lot to cover today, so with that, Rick, I will pass it over to you to get us started. Great. Thanks, Shay. So before we dive into Humana's experience and, and what Andy's going to share with you today, I just wanted to set a bit of context. Uh, you know, while it may vary from you know, one organization to the next, I think we can all acknowledge that you know, digital transformation is really driving explosive growth in users' applications and data, right? Users are no longer just employees, right? But it's the entire ecosystem, including contractors, suppliers, partners, vendors. You know, and I think we've seen certainly with the ease of cloud development and delivery, the adoption of cloud services, you know, certainly is driving significant growth in applications as well, you know, whether they're known by IT or not. Uh, and of course, the quantity of data, you know, particularly data stored in files or unstructured data that continues to grow by leaps and bounds. So, you know, to, to cope with this reality, you know, organizations really need to manage the link between their entire user population, you know, all their applications, and all their data. And this is this is really at the core of you know where identity governance can help. It's, it's really about you know answering the three questions you see here. And the first is you know who has access to what, right? Really understanding that current state, uh, that 360 degree view of who has access, and then it's understanding who actually should have access to what. Understanding what that desired state is, what access is appropriate. And then ultimately, how is that access being used? Is it stale? Is it current? You know, and, and of course, doing this, again, for all users, all applications, and all data. So when we look at some of the you know, key principles for effective identity governance, you know, I think you know, whether you've done this before or you, need a ref you know, haven't done this before, you need a refresher. I think the first one you know, includes the ability to increase awareness for identity. Uh, you know, identity governance, first of all, is, is a multifaceted you know, cross-functional challenge you know, for many of you, and really effective identity governance requires awareness across the organization. Uh, collaboration with the business and IT is, is needed from the outset. You know, the other nature here is, is accountability is also, you know, fundamental, particularly for the lines of business, uh, it, given they are the ones that truly know the users and the business functionality required for those users to perform the jobs, right? And they need to own that, whereas IT you know, really needs to support, you know, what applications and files that access may actually correspond to. And I think, you know, lastly, and this is one that I think can be often be the most difficult, is, is it driving that balance of least privileged principles, you know, and productivity with fine-grained governance. You know, thinking about that in another way is, is really identifying what access can be administered in a coarse-grained fashion and what should be administered in a fine-grained fashion. You know, I'm sure we've all encountered times, uh, you know, where access that can be granted coarsely with full access, you know, to quickly get access to something, you know, for productivity purposes. But in hindsight, right, it should have been more fine-grained controls given what risk that access represents to the organization. Uh, so I, I think as we look at this, though, that, you know, ultimately we really see how roles can help you achieve effective identity governance. You know, first, they're, they're very easy to, uh, for the business to understand and grasp and therefore to govern effectively because they understand them. Uh, but they're also very simple and cost effective for IT to administer. Uh, you know, we've seen that over the years, but you know, obviously don't just take my word for it here. I, I wanna turn it over now to, to Andy and he can share with you some of the success that Humana's achieved in that regard. Andy? 
Rick, thanks for, so much for the great introduction, um, and welcome everybody. It's great to have an opportunity to share with you some of our experience, and hopefully uh, from that experience uh, you, you will each be able to glean something that will be useful to you as, as you move forward. Uh, we want to share with you uh, what our enterprise journey has been related to role-based access. Um, and thinking through uh, where we have come from, well, we started out on this journey uh, really well over 10 years ago in one form or another, but really in earnest uh, in the last four years. Uh, and there were a number of business drivers that, that took us along this path uh, to move towards uh, role-based access. And uh, if you just if I'd have shown you this slide uh, four years ago, the, the order would have been slightly different. Um, but this represents the business opportunity as we see it today. Uh, looking at why we moved down uh, into a project or a program to, to build role-based access for the organization, we really had five key things that we wanted to address. Uh, first and foremost for us as an organization is to allow us to be able to move at the pace of our business. Uh, we're an organization that uh, sees change happen fairly quickly, uh, happening in a lot of different ways. Uh, for example, uh, we are a, a business that engages in acquisitions and divestitures on a fairly regular basis. So we are uh, constantly bringing new organizations into our organization, into our company, uh, and being able to support that, uh, including all of the applications and platforms uh, that come with that, uh, is a key piece of it. Uh, we also are, like many organizations, rapidly moving uh, towards a cloud-based environment. So we're seeing a lot of our traditional enterprise-based applications or, or premises-based applications moving towards the cloud. Um, and so uh, being able to support that migration becomes very key to us. Uh, also looking uh, at, at being able to decrease the time to market for our user community. Uh, as we look at what entitlement-based access, where we have come from, uh, represents for the business, and, and I think we can all relate to this, uh, it, it often takes days, sometimes weeks, uh, for users to get the access they need to become productive. Uh, it, it comes from a number of different sources. Uh, they may be requesting a bunch of different unique entitlements. Uh, they may not realize that there are dependencies that exist in their environment uh, that they need to address uh, by, by requesting access, for example, to AD as well as to an application. Um, and so being able to use roles to create uh, single request objects, if you will, that allow them to get the access they need to do their job uh, has significantly reduced the time to market for our users uh, so that they can get productive, uh, especially when you're onboarding a new uh, employee uh, or a new contractor. Uh, being able to get them productive as quickly as possible becomes a, a really key benefit for us. Uh, another one is to create exceptional customer experience. And I'm going to talk in a minute about what the the customer perceives uh, in an entitlement-based environment uh, and what they perceive in a role-based environment. But the idea of being able to speak business language and not IT language uh, becomes really key to this. Uh, and, and that's one of the keys to success to an RBAC program is focusing on this being a business-driven initiative and not an IT or security-driven initiative. Uh, I mentioned earlier that, that I might have put this in a different order a couple of years ago. The fourth one uh, was really number one for us when we started out our project, and that's to solve risk and audit exposures. Uh, we had, uh, had had a series of audit findings um, and issues that had been identified through our Sarbanes-Oxley and other uh, internal and external audit processes uh, that really were adding up to a significant exposure uh, for us as an organization. And that's really what drove us down the road towards using RBAC as a way to address those uh, ex exposures. But what you can see is, is that in terms of overall priority, that's moved way down the list. Uh, you look at the things at the top of the list, those are really the benefits that we're getting as an organization. Uh, and the risk exposures have fallen more or less to the bottom of the list for us in terms of what's driving our activity in this area. And then the last one, the one that I think every senior executive is interested in, is how can we drive down unit cost? Can we make it less costly uh, to deliver uh, access in our environment? Um, in, for some executives, that might be at the very top of the list, but for us, uh, we're really looking at how we can deliver a better user and, and business experience. And what we see is that unit cost um, uh, delivery uh, is really a natural result of this rather than the primary objective for us as we go forward. But I'll tell you what, getting from where we were, an entitlement-based environment, to role-based access uh, has been a significant effort. 
Uh, this is not something to be undertaken for the faint of heart. It is not a program that you can undertake and complete uh, in a year uh, with a couple of people dedicated to it. Uh, this has been a multi-year project for us. Uh, it has involved uh, dozens of, of dedicated resources to get us there. Uh, it is something that you have to do with intent. You have to keep your eye on the prize, on those business opportunities that I mentioned, uh, and continue to press forward, even though there are going to be times as you go through this process uh, that it feels like uh, you're, you're, you're swimming upstream. Um, there, there are a lot of challenges to prevent us to get there. So that kind of brings us to the question, why in the world would you do that? If it's going to take that much in terms of resources, cost, and time to get there, why would you go, go down that road? Uh, and for us, one of the things, and, and I mentioned this a moment ago, uh, is that describing a user's job to function as a list of access control entitlements really is difficult for business and for IT. Uh, in our environment, for example, we had a number of business units that were keeping spreadsheets uh, that were nothing more than the list of uh, AD groups and um, web access management uh, entitlements and application layer entitlements uh, that they would just request for everyone that came into their area. And typically there was an, an administrator who had that spreadsheet. Uh, when someone was hired, the administrator would send that out to them and say, hey, go request these items um, without anyone really understanding what they were requesting it or why they were requesting it. Uh, and so describing uh, those entitlements in, in IT-specific terms was frustrating for everybody all the way around. Uh, so moving to roles helps business and IT begin to speak the same language. Now, in order to get there, you really have to focus on the discipline of using business language, what we like to call plain English language, to describe what roles are and what they do so that when someone requests it, you've got uh, a better than average chance of them asking for the right thing. Uh, it also sim simplifies the process. Uh, it, our ideal would be that every user has one and only one role uh, that they request for their access. No additional access is, is required. If we can get to that point, that's a really simple transaction. I know what access I need to do my job. I request that access using simple business language, and I get the access I need to do my job. But furthermore, from my perspective as the one who manages the access, it also simplifies our process process for assigning it. In the past, when we would get a list of entitlements, we would have to send out numerous approval requests. We would have to track all of those through completion. Uh, then once we got those approvals back, we would have to go out and manually assign the access, application by application, platform by platform. By moving to roles and automating that process through IIQ, we're able to simplify that process. In some cases, it's as simple as assigning a single role to the user and then letting automation drive the provisioning. And even if it's not fully automated, it's driving uh, the, the assignment of access and the approval of that access so that it's nothing more than a, a simple provisioning action that has to be taken on behalf of the user. Um, finally, it also, and this kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier about addressing our risk exposures, helps us enforce the principles of minimum necessary. So every time we build out a role, uh, we're looking at that from a perspective of minimum necessary, separation of duties. Uh, can we build those controls into the roles without having to build complicated uh, certifications and, uh, uh, and access reports? Uh, and uh, complicated segregation of duties matrices that have to be evaluated every time somebody requests access. So there are numerous advantages to the user community, to the business uh, areas, and also to us from an access management organization as we go forward. Now when I talk about roles, what are we talking about? Um, look at the basics of it. Now, on the left-hand side is sort of the traditional uh, perspective. Every user has a unique set of entitlements that are assigned to them, uh, usually by request and approval, uh, that, that then is managed individually. There is no opportunity to leverage the commonality that exists between them, for example. Role-based access is really nothing more than creating a role that contains all the access that's in common and then assigning that to users. Uh, that plays out in a number of different ways, uh, but taken at its most simple, this is what role-based access uh, effectively is for the organization. Now, how does that play out in Humana's environment? 
Um, we use three uh, what we call discrete role types, uh, and these equate to uh, the two primary role types that are available within uh, IIQ. Uh, at the base level, we have something we call a worker type. Uh, that also would be known as birthright access. The worker type contains all of the default access that someone needs by virtue of who they are. Uh, so you might be a contractor who works for one of our business entities, and therefore you're going to get the access that is um, specifically appropriate for you as a contractor in that business entity. Or you might be an employee that works for our corporate office, and you'll get a different set of birthright or baseline access by virtue of that. That's all being driven by HR demographics. Uh, there is no human interaction involved with that worker type assignment. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, if you are assigned the appropriate worker type based on HR demographics, uh, you'll be able to do something productive. So for example, if you are an employee in our environment and you are assigned an employee worker type, you'll be able to access benefits information, uh, high-level uh, organizational um, uh, policies and procedures, uh, guidance documentation, uh, and th that sort of, of uh, access that is default to everyone. So you can be productive literally the minute that you are, your identity is created in our HR system and passed off to IIQ. Uh, it then automates the process of sending out the user ID and the password under separate cover uh, to the user or to their manager. They're able to log in and be productive with those uh, initial um, processes around um, what, what happens when someone's onboarded into our organization. The next level is what we call an access profile in our environment. Um, and, and I've been asked by a number of folks why we don't call that a role or a business role. And that was a conscious decision that was made uh, in our environment because we were already using the term role as something specific in our HR system. Uh, and so we chose to use a completely different term uh, so that we didn't create confusion between our HR processes uh, and, because, uh, and uh, around um, our uh, IT or access management processes. So we call it access profile. But an access profile is really the complete set of business functions that's required for a user to perform a specific job. Uh, and that's usually a collection of that next level down in our role structure, what we call access models. Uh, access models are collections of entitlements that enable a specific business function, typically associated with a single uh, application. Uh, and these are the fundamental building blocks that we use for everything. Uh, that would be called an IT role uh, in IIQ uh, language. So as we onboard new applications, uh, there's a discipline process to go out and begin building out the access models uh, that are associated with that application. Uh, those access models or IT roles are extremely valuable because they allow us, for example, to take into account those dependencies that, that typically exist for uh, enterprise applications. So, for example, you might need to have uh, access to a certain data set uh, as well as access to an application. Uh, as well as a specific uh, um, function within our web access management uh, environment. Um, so these are the, the fundamental building blocks that we use within our, our organization. And we have an entire uh, group within my, um, my organization, the access management organization, that's 100% focused on building out new access models for applications, and then assembling those into access profiles for our business areas. Uh, and they specifically um, work with individual business areas, what we would call a community, in order to build out those access profiles. Um, talk a little bit about why we use this community concept. Um, what we have done is we have built out our role structure so that we have peer groups that we call these communities. Uh, these are typically users with similar business functions. They are not always a single department. They may cross multiple departments. There are also instances where we have multiple communities within a single business unit or department uh, as well. The idea is we want to group users who have similar business functions. Um, it allows us to present to that community a limited variety of roles. So we're not exposing our entire role catalog to all of these users. 
but instead a small list of roles that are likely to be most appropriate for the users uh, within that community. And again, that community structure is typically aligned by an HR attribute, uh, a department or the leader over that area. Um, uh, but we have found this to be a really effective way for us to, uh, to manage the role structure and make it consumable by the user community. Uh, in our environment today, we've got uh, just over 100 discrete communities um, that we manage across our 70 to 80,000 users. Um, so you can do the math there and see that, that we've got about eight, you know, somewhere between 800 and 1,000 users per community, some larger, some smaller. Uh, and typically, we try to keep that, again, to around uh, 10 or less roles per community. And we're looking in the future uh, to being able to use um, uh, artificial intelligence tools to help us build out better peer groups. So today we're doing that primarily based on organizational structures, uh, but what we'd like to do is be able to dive into the data that's contained within our IAM ecosystem, um, primarily within SailPoint IIQ, uh, to be able to pull out good peer group groupings that may or may not necessarily directly correspond to our environment. Uh, and also use those AI tools to help us build better roles. So if you kind of go back to uh, what we were talking about, our role structure, and then look at this community, uh, we have a lot of hope that, uh, that using AI and machine learning is going to help us uh, even better fine-tune our community structure and our role structure uh, as we go forward as an organization. So given those two things, those, those key building blocks of how we've approached it, uh, the next question becomes, how do you go about succeeding, and what do you need to do in order for an RBAC environment to, uh, to succeed or to, to deploy RBAC within your organization? Uh, and it really is an alignment exercise. Uh, I like this picture because if you, if you know anything about crew, uh, you know that everyone has to row equally. Uh, if anyone is out of balance, the, the boat's not going to go straight and it's not going to go fast. Uh, and if your objective is for your RBAC program to head towards the goal uh, and get there as quickly as possible, you've really got to have alignment of all the players. Uh, in our environment, we have a dedicated IAM program team uh, that's made up of cross-organizational representatives, including a, a clear governance process, uh, as well as the individual resources, project managers, uh, business analysts, consultants, uh, architects who are involved in the deployment of our IAM uh, capability, including our RBAC. We also have representation from our, all of our business areas. And so as we look at, for example, at each one of those hundred odd communities that we have in our organization, uh, we have contacts within those communities who are giving us feedback about the process. Uh, who are actively engaged in the RBAC process and, and, and driving that forward. Uh, it's also important to have our leadership, and, and we are fortunate uh, that we have leadership uh, all the way to the very top of our organization who have bought into uh, the RBAC program, uh, who are giving us the air support necessary to keep driving this forward uh, and also allow us the time to be able to do this correctly. Uh, and so uh, that is a tremendous luxury that we have, is that we have that top-down support to make certain that we're able to drive this forward. Uh, and as you look at the, the idea of going towards role-based access, I would strongly encourage you to engage uh, people at the highest level of your organization in order to engage them with that process. We are increasingly seeing the importance of making certain that we have all of our IT teams engaged in this process. Uh, as we expand the footprint of our RBAC program, uh, as we onboard new applications and platforms into our IAM ecosystem, uh, having the IT teams that actually are developing those interfaces at the table has been very, very important. Uh, some of our early successes have been because we had the right IT people around the table. Uh, and uh, if we're looking at some of, I won't call them failures, but areas where we ran into barriers, it was because we didn't engage uh, those downstream IT teams early enough in the process. And then finally, making certain that you have your audit and compliance teams engaged with the discussion uh, because you are changing the way that access is being assigned. We uh, were very intentional about educating our, our auditors, for example, on the difference between how access is requested 
approved and granted in an entitlement-based environment as opposed to in a role-based access environment. Uh, making certain that they understood that as we went forward uh, was another key objective that, that we were very intentional about making sure that we, uh, that we had alignment with. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side of this, uh, making certain that you understand how much time it's going to take, uh, that you have uh, allocated the time and the resources necessary to get there, that you have a clear roadmap for how you're going to get from point A to point B and what the right order is, uh, that you're working with your release management people to incorporate the key pieces of this into your release plan. Uh, one of the things that, quite honestly, I didn't expect was because IIQ is an extremely integrated platform, perhaps one of the most integrated platforms in all of our enterprise, uh, the impact of our enterprise release plan uh, that that would have on our ability to deploy uh, new collectors and connectors and aggregations in our environment, um, we really didn't understand that until we had gotten pretty deeply into this. And there were times when we were not able to move as quickly as we wanted to because we had not taken into account uh, the impact not only of the IIQ release process, but also on the connected applications uh, and the release plans associated with those and making sure that we had all the right people involved with that. And then as part of that roadmap, making sure you have a clear set of priorities. And we did that by having a clear governance process. Uh, we have a senior executive governance committee over our IAM program. We have a dedicated IAM program office uh, that is helping to drive manage those roadmaps, uh, help us with the, the release plan and the integration effort and integration resources, and then making certain that we're constantly communicating where we are, where we're going, uh, what, we, what has been accomplished, and how we can be successful going forward has, has been another key to that. Uh, again, stressing, this is for us has been now a four-year journey, uh, and so if we had not uh, aligned on all of these elements, I think we would have not been in anywhere near as successful as we have been in, in deploying role-based access in our environment. So let's take a look at what the, the role-based access lifecycle looks like, uh, at least in our environment. And we see this as being five key uh, processes. Um, from beginning to end, and the, that last one, the maintenance end, being the way that we are managing uh, ongoing maintenance of roles. And so this is the life cycle of a role. Uh, the first one is, is the engineering process. How do you create new roles for a community? Uh, and that role engineering process is a process to, to, uh, that allows us to go and review the specific access needs of a business community identify the key applications and platforms that are needed by that business community. Uh, that, that helps us drive the prioritization of onboarding of new applications and existing applications into the IAM ecosystem. And then finally, creating the roles. Um, that also includes, by the way, uh, piloting, testing, validation uh, of those roles before we migrate them pr to production and make them available for assignment by users. The next step in that process, once we've gotten through that engineering, uh, is the formal review and approval of the composition of that role by all of the stakeholders of the role. So that would be a role owner for each one, as well as the owners of all of the access represented by those roles. Uh, so that certification process is one of those key things for us as an organization. Um, the next step in the process is really what I would call the, the, the money process, and that is the assignment of roles to users. Uh, that's when you begin to get the value of your RBAC process is when uh, those roles have been made available. They can be uh, requested by a user. They can be approved by the owner and then assigned to the user uh, and begin to deliver the value of uh, RBAC to that particular business community. And that's uh, effectively the way that we have rolled this out uh, is by uh, working through these community by community. Then when you get into the ongoing uh, processes in the life cycle, uh, we do a recertification. Uh, we require the owner to review and recertify the composition of the role on an annual basis, uh, again, to make certain that there aren't additional access that needs to be added or potentially access that is no longer needed for each individual role. 
And by doing that recertification process, we are able to significantly reduce the user-based certification activity that we have to undertake. Uh, and we, our ultimate objective is to move to a model where we only have to recertify at the user level for exceptional access, access that is granted outside of the role uh, as we go forward. And then the final piece of that is, is once we get through all of these, we take the role, it goes into our ongoing maintenance process. Uh, that includes how someone can request something to be added to a role, uh, how someone can request a change in ownership uh, or approver for a role, uh, potentially the change in the name or the description associated with the role to make it more intuitive for those who use the roles or request those roles. Uh, so that's all built into this maintenance process around uh, each individual role. Uh, in our environment. So let's break down the first circle there and the actual role engineering process to give you a sense for what it takes to get from uh, point A to point B um, um, in terms of how a role gets engineered. Uh, and to give you a feel for the size of the, of the team, uh, when we were actively in role-based development, now we've moved into that maintenance cycle as an organization, but as we were we were initially uh, building out our role environment. Uh, we had uh, 17 discrete people involved in our role engineering team. I had a project manager uh, who was coordinating the activity, uh, four individual role coordinators. Those role coordinators were the ones who worked with individual communities. And at any given point in time, those role coordinators were working with four or five discrete communities um, on that process. Those role coordinators then had access to uh, a group of role engineers who were actually doing the individual role assessment, analytics, and role composition work uh, around that. So the role coordinators were the primary business communicators. The role engineers were the ones that were out there doing the work. If you look at a single community in our environment, uh, it took about 10 to 12 weeks, three months, to work through all of the steps in identifying the users associated with a community, the applications associated with that community, and then building out the roles associated with that particular community. Um, and so if you do that and work, work through the Gantt chart, uh, you see that uh, across our entire environment with about 100 to 120 communities, uh, it took us about three years to do the entire role engineering process. Uh, but at the community level, you see the conveyor belt at the bottom. Uh, typically, it looked like this. The role coordinator would set up a kickoff meeting uh, with that business community and the leaders within that business community to educate them on the RBAC process, the approach, and the benefits for them. They would then uh, work through identifying the key applications associated with that and make certain that those applications had indeed been onboarded into our IAM environment. Um, if not, then we queued up those applications for uh, our formal application onboarding process. A completely different process, uh, but uh, that would be become the trigger for that process to be initiated. Um, once that was done, we would load the existing entitlements for the target applications for all those users in the community and begin the access modeling process to identify common access patterns uh, which then led to the development of those roles uh, by working with the business, and then finally that role certification process to test, validate, and finally certify that role before we deployed it to the organization. Uh, so like I said, this is about a three-month process in working with an individual community. So when you project that out across the entire organization, it looks somewhat like this. Um, in the first year, uh, we started out by defining our communities. Uh, we did a pilot of the process to, to prove that out and went through the role engineering process with uh, about 50% of our communities. Uh, by the end of that first year, we had completed the certification process with about 25% of our communities. The second year, we finished the role engineering process for all of those communities. We worked through the certification process for another 50% of those communities uh, and then moved into role assignment. And that role assignment, our first role assignments, didn't happen until well into that second year of our RBAC process. Uh, by the time we got to the end of the third year, 
Uh, we had effectively completed the role engineering, the role certification, and the assignment, the initial assignment of roles to all of our users, uh, and then moved into uh, the year four where we looked at how we operationalize that process uh, and move into more of a continuous maintenance uh, life cycle rather than the, that, that initial uh, build and deployment of roles across the environment. Uh, we held pretty closely to the schedule. Uh, so 2018 uh, is year four for us. Uh, we are in the midst of our RBAC operationalization process. Uh, we have learned a tremendous amount about how to be successful, uh, which has caused us to go back um, and adjust our processes from what we've learned uh, to continue to deliver value. Uh, so we are looking now to work directly with those communities. We get active feedback from them about role composition, active feedback from them about the process, uh, about the user experience. All of those things are being fed into our continuous improvement process so that we can continue to drive better and better role creation, role composition, uh, and better user experience for our users as we go. So taking all of that, knowing that we are in that process where we're now uh, doing role optimization, uh, what is next for us as an organization? Um, role maturity is a key piece to it. This is a, a continual process. Uh, we've got certain of our communities that are more engaged than others and are actively giving us feedback about how to improve their roles. Uh, so we're spending a lot of our energy uh, from a role engineering standpoint improving the quality of the roles to make them more effective, more efficient for the users. Um, we are exploring uh, AI and machine learning, as I mentioned earlier, as a way for us to dive into uh, the, the uh, millions of records that we have related to our IAM program uh, to look at how we can uh, make this a less manual process, constructing better roles using AI, um, learning from uh, access patterns from our users using machine learning, and applying that with the objective that ultimately um, we want to move away from a request-driven environment towards one where it's much more uh, based on who you are, uh, the, the HR role that you're assigned, that sort of thing. Uh, we spent a significant amount of energy this year on application onboarding, uh, which is really the process of expanding the footprint of our IAM platform uh, in, in getting more and more applications pulled into IIQ so that we can continue uh, to enrich the quality, the breadth, and the coverage of roles. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating to a business community than us going to them and saying uh, that uh, role-based access is going to transform how you do business and then go back to them and say, but we can only do roles for 50% of your applications. You're still going to need to do discrete entitlement requests for the other applications that you use in your, in your environment. The reaction from the business there is, is you not only not made my life simpler, you've made it more complex because now you're asking me to know what I can request with roles and continue to do individual access requests. So we've put a lot of energy going uh, from an application on, uh, into our application onboarding process to have a structured way to bring new applications. Uh, we have, in the last year, uh, expanded that application onboarding process to uh, put in place a cloud onboarding process. Uh, so as we continue to migrate more and more of our enterprise applications towards the cloud, being able to rapidly onboard cloud applications has become a key part of that. We're also looking at how to create a much more unified user experience. Uh, today, uh, users, even from an IAM perspective, um, are only, uh, are, are, we're asking them to go to uh, a, uh, an access catalog, what we call a request for access portal. We're asking them to go to IIQ, and we're asking them to go to ServiceNow, depending on where they are in the process. Um, although we have made that a fairly unified process, the look and feel of each one of those is pretty consistent, we're still asking the users to go to multiple places. That gets even more complex when we start talking about other IT processes outside of IAM. Uh, and so uh, looking at, for example, how you request access to a building, physical access, how you request access to a telephone system, how you request access to uh, a laptop or request a laptop, those are all things that ultimately could be incorporated into our RBAC program, 
uh, because at the end of the day, they're just assets that users need to do their job. Uh, we're also uh, have gotten significant feedback from users that the business descriptions that we use for our entitlements and our roles still are too tech techy, if you will. Uh, they want us to begin uh, using much more business-centric descriptions. Uh, so rather than calling something um, a, 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 an AD group a name that only an IT person could love, uh, maybe giving it a, uh, an intuitive business name instead so that when they're requesting access to uh, the uh, finance system, it might be something like uh, financial reporting uh, for financial analysts as opposed to F underscore FIN underscore 123, which is uh, typically how a lot of our entitlements were, were, were labeled. And then all of this leads towards uh, a, a concept that we're beginning to evolve that we have called zero request access. Um, ultimately, for a significant number of our users, we want to be able to use AI and to use HR data to project the correct role for each user and automatically assign that in such a way that we have a high uh, degree of confidence that the access that they receive as a result of the assigned role will meet the needs. Now, we will never get to 100%. There will always be supplemental access, and there will always be users who are outliers who, who don't cleanly fit into an RBAC model. But in looking at our organization right now, we believe about 80% of our users will be able to get all of the access they need with a single role assignment, and that we can indeed get to the point with AI and machine learning uh, to be able to do that assignment in such a way that we have high confidence that users will get the access that they need. Uh, that's something that's really, really exciting to us. Uh, it's something that we are watching very closely as SailPoint is evolving the capabilities of IIQ uh, and related tools. Uh, and so it, it, as we move forward, these are the, the things, and, and, and you know, to be very straightforward about it, zero request access wasn't even something on our radar when we started out with, with building out our RBAC program some four years ago. Now it's something that we see as being a very, very real possibility for us as an organization. So I'm very excited about what we've gotten from our back up to this point, but even more excited about where that's going to take us at this point in time. So with that, I'm going to toss, uh, uh, toss over to Shay for any questions that you might have, and we will open up at this point for that. Great. Thank you, Andy. Okay, we will go ahead and dive in. Um, so our first question, Andy, what metrics does Humana use to evaluate the success of roles and their impact on your identity governance program? That's a great question and something that we have spent a lot of time and energy trying to figure out how to do that effectively. Um, we have a number of metrics that we have established that we track on a continuous basis. Um, a couple of those I'll share with you that we use and we evaluate literally on a monthly basis and ask the question, what does this tell us about our RBAC program and the success of that? Uh, one of those is the number or percent of users who have currently assigned business roles. Uh, right now we hover at about 92 or 93% of all of our users have an assigned primary business role. Uh, we're constantly working to uh, address the, the 7 8% that don't have a primary business role. Most of those are, are a result of churn in our environment, people who have left and, and have been rehired, uh, but, but that's one metric. Uh, another metric is the number of users who are in roles that are not assigned, aligned to the community that they are assigned to. Uh, that is an indication potentially that users are not uh, moving out of uh, inappropriate roles and into appropriate roles. That's one that we manage closely. Uh, we also monitor the, the average number of entitlements that are assigned to, to users outside of their primary business role. Um, and, and what we're looking to do is to drive down the average number of what we'll call exceptions or supplemental access outside of roles. So that's a real metric that we use uh, to also measure how successful roles, how how well suited they are to the business needs. So, so that's a, that's a, a couple of those um, that, that we use today to manage that. Great, thank you. Okay, Andy, um, another question for you. Roles can be a big endeavor for any organization to take on and often a multi-year effort. 
Is it worth it? Well, I think you can tell from the enthusiasm that I have for the program um, that, that we believe that it is. Um, and, and there are a couple of things that we're using to, to really measure that, uh, to, to, to be able to explain to our senior leadership, for example, why it's worth the journey. Um, I talked earlier about time to market. Uh, RBAC really does simplify the request and approval process. If you've got good roles, um, then it is possible for someone to make a single request and get all the access they need to do their job. That's real value to the business area. Um, requests are, again, the, the idea is, is that our roles are written in business language, um, and so therefore we're looking for high levels of satisfaction, and we measure that from them. Um, and, and that's another thing that, that makes it worth it to us. Uh, we're also looking to automate the workflow uh, so that, as I mentioned earlier, that the access is, is granted uh, with a minimum, a minimal amount of approvals and a minimal amount of manual provisioning activity. That's real cost savings. That's cost savings to the business because they can be productive earlier. Uh, it's also cost savings to us because it takes fewer people to manage that. Uh, and then finally, you know, going back to the original business driver that we had, um, by allowing us to ensure minimum necessary and separation of duties, that helps keep us compliant and free of uh, what I would call unnecessary attention from our auditors. Excellent. Thank you. Rick, how do you see big data and behavioral analysts and impacting role management? Behavioral analysis, excuse me. Yeah, so, uh, um that's a big one. I think it's a it's a huge opportunity. In some ways, uh, you know, I, I think we'll see role management continue to evolve further with you know AI and machine learning, as, as Andy touched on. I, I think it'll even make it more accessible uh, uh, for those that maybe haven't gone down the path uh, to date. Um, you know, I think Andy shared some great background uh, in, in in I think there's even ways that, you know smaller organizations can uh, address this and take things away. Um, it's, it's just a small bundles of access. Um, and, and I think, you know, AI and machine learning can also help that by posing, you know, an opportunity for new roles to be created based on commonalities that, and access. Because in some ways, I think machine learning and behavior anal anal analytics uh, is going to allow for continuous analysis, right? So not only in helping define that current uh, you know, that new potential role structure, but also ensuring roles that actually have been defined remain current and they reflect the access that they should govern, right? Now, I think there's also, you know, you know, while a lot of promise is always with AI and machine learning, I think establishing trust in that is paramount and its effectiveness. Um, that's not just a role management statement, uh, that's AI as a, in general, but, you know, I think overall it's a big impact. We're specifically innovating here right now, so for those that want to learn more on that front, um, you know, we'd, we'd love to talk to you and, and, and discuss your thoughts there as well. Great. Thank you, Rick. Okay, let's dive into our next question. What tools were used for role engineering? Was it Identity IQ or anything else apart from this? Uh, the that's a great question. We organizationally used a, a variety of different tools. Uh, there's a really, really um, unusual tool that we use for a lot of our role engineering called Excel. Um, we basically, it, it was, a, when we started out the process, we used uh, Excel and Access and IIQ role mining tools uh, to model out the access so when we would go out, for example, and interview with a business area and find out the applications, we would then dive down to that in Excel um, and work through uh, building out a list of entitlements, especially if they already had a list of entitlements. That helped us tremendously. We would use the role mining tools in IIQ uh, to help us identify where there were commonalities. Uh, I think if we were doing it today, we would do it slightly differently. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, some of the, the AI capabilities that are coming um, from SailPoint uh, that will help us in this realm uh, as we go forward. And, and I think, you know, a year from now even, the role engineering process will look completely different uh, than it did when we started out our process. Got it. Thank you, Andy. Um, we'll just take a couple more because we're running out of time. Um, next question, 
this would seem to be a challenging, daunting task for a smaller company with limited resources. Andy, what are your recommendations to a smaller company who is starting this process? One of the advantages I think that a smaller company is going to have is that their application portfolio will be a lot narrower. Um, if you look at an organization Humana's size, uh, we have a very, very large application portfolio. Uh, hundreds if not thousands of applications in our environment. Uh, and so managing access across all of those applications and representing them as roles uh, is an extremely challenging and daunting task. Uh, a smaller company, because they are going to have a narrower uh, application suite, uh, I think is going to have an opportunity to be more successful faster uh, than a large enterprise organization is. Um, the, the, the key there is to really understand what the key applications are, what the business needs are, and where you can get the, the, the highest leverage in role-based access. Uh, RBAC is one of those things where the 80-20 rule, or maybe even the 90-10 rule, applies in spades. Uh, that, that ultimately, you can build out roles that make sense for uh, 80 or 90 percent of the people with a smaller, uh, narrower portion of your application uh, portfolio uh, and, and then not have to stress about the outliers. And I think once we learned that we don't have to uh, necessarily get 100 percent coverage, the process and, and the, the task became a lot less daunting. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question, and before we address it, just know if we didn't have time to answer your question here live, we will follow up with you after. Um, but last question for you, Andy. How have you avoided role explosion? This is a, a question that, that we asked even before we started the process. Uh, it's one that I get asked fairly often uh, from peer companies, uh, other companies that are going down this role, uh, and, and it usually goes something like this. Well, if we go towards role-based access, the access in our environment is so unique for all of our users uh, that, that I think we're going to end up having a role for every user. Um, and if that is, is the mindset, uh, role explosion is inevitable. Uh, what we have focused on is going back to that 80-20 rule, this idea of understanding that, that if we can represent 80% of the access that someone needs, um, that, that we can represent that with, again, eight to ten roles per community. And we found that it, by being disciplined to try to keep the number of roles per community down to a minimum, uh, that we are able to uh, avoid role explosion as we go forward. It really requires a lot of discipline to get there. You have to be intentional, uh, but you also have to be willing to let go of the idea that you have to, that you uh, to be successful, you have to build 100% effective roles. An 80% effective role is much more valuable to you and much easier to get to um, than you might think that it is. And trying to avoid the temptation to drive towards 100% effective roles uh, will keep you from moving into a role explosion model. Excellent. Thank you. OK, everyone, that is all the time that we have for questions today. Um, but keep an eye out for an email from us tomorrow. That will include a recording of today's webinar. And we will also be sending you a data sheet on role-based access control if you'd like to dig in a little bit deeper. Andy, Rick, thank you for your time today. Thanks to everyone who joined us on the line. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.